Hello, and welcome uh, to Module 3 and the final week of our class. Now, this week we're going to talk about two very different but similar subjects. Uh, I'm going to give you a short introduction to the work of Sigmund Freud here. We're going to talk about our unconscious and how all that works and how Freud is connected to people like Nietzsche and Marx. Um, and then I'm also going to give a brief lecture uh, about the civil rights movement in the United States. Now, I just want to remind everybody, this is the last week of this class. And if you have work to turn in, you have to get it in by Friday, okay? All the essays are due by Friday. All the questions are due by Friday. I have not done adaptive release, so you can turn all that stuff in uh, right up until 11.58 p.m. on Friday. And you'll still get full credit for it, okay? So, I hope you guys are staying healthy and safe. I hope you're staying home mostly, and social distancing and washing your hands. Okay, now Freud fits into the story that we've told so far in this class in the following way. Um, Freud is to the, Ameri or to the uh, subconscious, right? To the way that our mind works, as Marx is to the economy. A lot of people, previous to Freud, all right, um, had really believed that the human mind was this fabulously complex thing and it was created by God and we shouldn't really mess around with it. In the 19th century, we begin to see people, even before Freud, all right, who want to apply this enlightenment idea, all right, that all of nature works by a certain set of rules to the human mind, to that beautiful, complex thing that really separates us from other kinds of of animals, all right? Um, the human mind has allowed us to survive throughout the ages, and up until this day, all right, we are still finding out new and amazing things about the human mind. But just as Caravaggio's realism, all right, helps us to understand the religious themes he talks about, and Marx's critique of the economy, and uh, Nietzsche's destruction of previous moralities, Freud kind of blows up the idea um, that the human mind doesn't follow the same rules as other things. All right, So he's going to try to set out some rules for us to follow in trying to not only understand how our mind works, but understand how we can fix it when it's broken. A lot of Freud's theories are about trauma and about the ways in which previous traumas, especially in our childhood, affect us as adults. Now, I should say right up front, um, I think Freud is fascinating to read about. Um, I have various issues and problems along the way, but let's get started. So this first quote, okay, a man should not strive to eliminate his complexes, but to get into accord with them. They are legitimately what directs his conduct in the world. Now, what Freud is telling us is two things. First of all, everybody has problems. All right? Nobody is perfect. And so instead of striving for a kind of perfection that is well beyond what we could get, all right, we should accept the fact that um, we all have problems and thus we can deal with those problems and become better people. Um, second of all, the way that we think and see the world all right, is formed over time. So experiences in our childhood make the adult people that we are now. Now, that may seem like a very obvious idea, but in the 19th century, it wasn't necessarily. And again, Freud's work on the ways in which various kinds of traumas, right? Various kinds of bad things that happen to us uh, when we're kiddos shape the way that our mind sees the world was at the time pretty revolutionary. Now, um, Freud, uh, is born in 1856. All right. He eventually dies in 1939. And a lot of what Freud begins to think about comes from his own life. All right. Now he's got some kind of weird things. So he has two half brothers and his mother is the same age as one of his half brothers. And what we're going to see, all right, is that a lot of Freud's ideas about mothers and about fathers, and I don't know why I'm yawning so much, 
um, derived from his own particular uh, upbringing. Now, his father uh, was Jewish. He was a wool merchant. And eventually, Freud is going to land in Vienna, which is the city in Europe that he is most uh, associated with. Um, being a Jew, he has to flee Vienna eventually, and he dies in London in 1939. Now, again, as I said, a lot of Freud's thought comes back to Freud's own upbringing. All right. And not only some of the weird mother stuff that we're going to talk about, um, but also, again, how trauma affects us. All right. And Freud had this wonderful ideas about the mind and about dreams. All right. And we're going to talk about a lot more that dreams were the way in which our subconscious mind worked out things that our conscious mind was too afraid to kind of talk about um, within the light of day. So we're going to be going over a lot of these other theories. Now, just a quirky fact, uh, Freud took a lot of cocaine. You may be saying, well, that's pretty early for cocaine. It is. But uh, cocaine in the 19th century was more thought of as sort of a drug uh, with medicinal purposes, but uh, Freud smoked cigars and did a lot of coke. So it's just kind of a bizarre part of his personality. Now, speaking of personality, um, basically there are three parts to the human mind as Freud saw it, all right? And basically the first is the id. And I'll talk more about these a little bit later, but the id is basically ruled by the pleasure principle. And the pleasure principle means that the id, this part of your mind, is always seeking things that feel good. And is conversely always running away from things that don't feel good. Okay, so the id is the part of your brain that is completely driven by seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Now, your ego as he calls it, E-G-O, all right, uh, is basically how your brain functions in reality, all right? It recognizes what is real and uh, what behaviors uh, are proper or not proper. Uh, this is the part of your brain where you have your mental reasoning, your logic. Um, this is a part of your brain that basically gets you through the day. It tells you whether to push or pull the door. Um, it organizes all your thoughts as you talk to people, all right? It's the logic center of your brain. Now, the superego, all right, is a part of your brain that contains all of your moral values, basically. And so while your id is constantly simply seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, your superego is a more complex part of your brain that's telling you, well, even though that may be pleasurable and I want to do it, it's not socially acceptable. All right. It's sort of the morality of your brain. Now, all three parts of your brain are functioning all the time. All right. And you are processing information and making decisions. Now, a lot of this happens in your subconscious. Now, your subconscious mind is a part of your brain that helps to deal with the experiences in your life, but is not... Um, like your, your, your normal brain that you use every day, all right? And some traumas are so painful that they have to be dealt with in the subconscious or else we would simply never really be able to do anything, right? A good way to think about this is you don't remember every time you fell down as a toddler and hurt yourself. The reason for that is because if you did, life would be too traumatic and you'd never go get on a bike again. So your subconscious helps to keep those traumas in a place where they can be dealt with, but they don't really get in your way. Now, anxiety, all right, we all deal with anxiety, all right? And basically your brain has a lot of really complicated ways to take uh, trauma, all right, and lead it away from your normal thinking brain. So we get denial of trauma, all right? Displacement, intellectualization, projected rationalization, 
All right, these are all ways in which your brain is trying to keep your cognitive thought going, basically keep one foot in front of the other as you go through your day, but still trying to deal with these traumas at a subconscious level. And Freud told us that this, this push-pull between your conscious and your unconscious brain is what brings up tension and anxiety. Now, for Freud, all right, if you don't deal with the things that are stuck down in your subconscious eventually, okay, this is going to lead to them surfacing, but not always surfacing in the way that you think. All right, so, you know, basically what this is, is that you're really, really nervous about one thing. Maybe it's a trauma in your past, and maybe it's something that's so painful that you've simply repressed it your subconscious will continue to repress this memory, but your conscious, okay, may begin to express itself in bizarre ways. Sometimes you have a Freudian slip, all right, a slip of the tongue where you mean one thing and you say another. Or sometimes you have certain kinds of neurotic behaviors, certain kind of weird behaviors, right, that aren't really related to the things that they seem to be about because they're really related to this deep-seated trauma that's buried way back in your past. Now, aside from trauma, Freud also had uh, very interesting ideas about sex. Now, he kind of had a fixation about sex and the central uh, part that sex plays in our lives. And basically... What Freud tells us is that when people have various kinds of problems, sexual problems, mental problems, they're often centered or expressed uh, through sex. And Freud tells us that from the time that we're very young, all right, we are basically on the path to developing a healthy sexuality. But there are many problems with that, and sometimes that are sexuality that develops even when we're young children doesn't fully develop and then as adults we get all messed up so in order to fix those kinds of traumas in our adult life okay we have to go back through a period of psychoanalysis to find that original trauma which probably lies in our childhood now again the pleasure principle Okay, seems to apply here that our id simply wants things that are all good and pleasurable all the time. And our super ego is the one that kind of overlays that and basically prevents us from being sexually inappropriate, right? So people that have various kinds of problems have those problems because they can't navigate the proper relationship between their id and their super ego. All right, now a few other ideas. We're going to talk a little bit more about dreams in a minute. But Freud had this very useful concept of ambivalence. And ambivalence, he got this concept from after the fact, after his father died. He had these very conflicted dreams and emotions. And ambivalence is basically when we have two different kinds of feelings about someone or something at the same time. And we often see this in terms of ideas of sex or in terms of ideas of self-worth, all right? When we love ourselves, but we also hate ourselves, all right? And all of us have a struggle within ourselves, all right, where we think that we are good people doing good things, but then part of our other brain is harsh and very negative, right? And a lot of the people that Freud saw on his couch all right, had this unrelentingly negative opinion of themselves, okay, that was trapped within this idea of ambivalence. We are ambivalent about ourselves. We're not sure if we're good or not, all right? And again, this often goes back to traumas largely in our childhood and exploring these things through uh, psychoanalysis, right? So free association, through talking through things, because there are connections that our conscious mind doesn't want us to see, right? Because it has hid these traumas back in our subconscious. And again, this was a very new and radical idea during Freud's time, all right? We have it a lot around today. 
but the idea that through simply talking through memories in your past, all right, you could connect the problems that you have today to a trauma that you might not even remember is a very radical idea. Now, of course, lots of Freud jokes, right? Um, Freud really, really liked his mom, and he came up with something called the Oedipus Complex, okay, which is why you have this conflict with your father, because deep down, and this is going to sound weird, and I'm sorry not to say this to you in person, but deep down, you want to kill your father and marry your mother. Now, this conflict, according to Freud, arises in all male children, and eventually, as we grow older, okay, we go past this phase, and then we begin to identify with our father as we become a man. Now, a healthy relationship like that, okay, we get past this Oedipus complex, and we then go on to find a wife, and everything's great. Some people never get past that. They get stuck in this real conflict with the father, and that can lead to terrible kinds of psychoses and mental problems later on in life. Again, we talked about the levels of awareness and consciousness, all right? The conscious mind is your everyday mind, the mind that's probably kind of bored right now. That is uh, your, your conscious mind, your pre-conscious mind, all right, is sort of the way that your mind functions when you're a very young child, right? It's the reason, again, you don't remember a lot from the time when you're very, very young. And your subconscious mind, all right, which is basically where you place all these traumatic things that have happened to you and where you try to work them out. Now, how do you work them out? Ooh, here we go. Let's talk about dreams. Now, Freud called dreams the royal road to the unconscious. All right. And basically for Freud, what he's talking about is that, again, when we have these traumas, all right, we repress these traumas. And the reason we repress them is because basically our mind evolutionarily is trying to make it so that we can still perform the basic functions of our body, right? We still have to go out and hunt. We still have to get food. We still have to work our job and raise our kids and all that good stuff. So what the subconscious does is it takes things that would prohibit those basic functions because we'd be thinking about this trauma and we'd be so sad, and it smushes them down into the subconscious. Now, in dreams, according to Freud, all right, dreams are the way that our subconscious tries to uh, process and work out these traumas but not in the conscious mind out in the world because we're too afraid to do that because the pleasure principle, right, has us recoiling from painful things. So in dreams, okay, we can try to process these traumas. Now dreams, as we all know, are sort of fun spaces, right, crazy spaces inside our minds where we can fly or we have superpowers or whatever. But according to Freud, all right, if you write down your dreams and you go through your dreams, um, you can pick out the things that your dreams are trying to do. What are you trying to process, right? What trauma are you trying to, um, you know, get rid of or understand, all right? Dreams had their own language, and they were your uncensored um, subconscious, right? Trying desperately to deal with the things that were too traumatic for you to deal with in your conscious mind. Now, Freud had three of these kind of stages of the unconscious mind, all right? Now, the descriptive unconscious um, basically is all the things in your unconscious that we don't see in our conscious mind, all right? So we're not even aware that they're there. And again, that is our mind of these three sections trying to protect us from these very traumatic events. Now, the dynamic unconscious, all right, is basically our subconscious taking thoughts away from our conscious mind as this defense mechanism, all right? And it's doing this again because we have these conflicted attitudes about these traumas. 
All right, so it is trying to allow the conscious mind to function on some sort of everyday level um, by removing the traumatic events and putting them down into the subconscious. Now, this last idea we can just kind of skip over, but basically the point of the subconscious mind, all right, is that we use the subconscious mind almost as a repository for very traumatic events that we couldn't deal with in our everyday mind. The subconscious then tries to process these events using dreams and to reintroduce them into our conscious mind in a less traumatic format. Now, if we don't deal with these traumas, however, they're going to pop up in our conscious mind in ways that we don't always understand. Fear, anxiety, anger, all right, those things are gonna bubble to the surface and we're not gonna know why, right? We'll have anger at particular kinds of people. We'll dislike certain kinds of things and we won't understand until we really unpack this fear and this anger that it will lead us back to a particular trauma, all right? And again, a trauma so traumatic that the subconscious has simply um, taken it out of our conscious memory. Now, if we go back to these three terms, the id, the ego, and the superego, all right? Um, these are sort of what make up our psychic apparatus, all right? Um, how we kind of deal, uh, again, with all this trauma. And another thing for Freud, right, that's important to understand is that for Freud, everyone had trauma. It wasn't just terrible, terrible things in your past, sexual abuse, violence, things like that. Everybody on an everyday scale has some sort of trauma, all right? Some kind of thing that your mind reacted negatively to that you suppress. Now, some people have more trauma than others, and not all traumas are equal, but we all have trauma in our life, all right? And so recognizing that allows us the ability to not be too judgmental of ourselves, right? Sort of the first step to getting better is saying, okay, I have this trauma, I'm a human person, all human persons have trauma, so how can I try to work this out, right? How can I ferret out those traumas down in my subconscious, bring them up to my conscious mind and deal with them? Okay, so the id, again, is our basic drive center. Um, it's the place in our mind that acts according to the pleasure principle and the avoidance of pain. All right, you can think of the id uh, almost as our animal instinct. All right, the id uh, wants things that are pleasurable, if that's sex, if that's good food, if that's whatever it is. And unhinged, all right, the id will always move towards the pleasure principle and will always revert away from pain. So the id is important in taking the traumatic events that happen in your life and suppressing them deep down in the subconscious. Now, he also called it the great reservoir of libido. Uh, it's where our sexual drive comes from. And it's an important part of being a human being. All right, so there's nothing negative or wrong about the id. Um, it's just that it only does one thing. Now, contrasted to the id, all right, is the ego. Now, the ego is the rational part of your mind, all right? Um, it seeks to please the id. However, it does so within the confines of reality, all right? The ego is the part of our mind that is more rational, and it understands that it can derive pleasure, can please the id from things that are less simple and immediate. Here you have rationality, long-term planning, all right, things that are further away from simple root satisfaction of your lust, basically. The ego also helps to separate um, things that are real and things that are not real. And the ego kind of um, makes sense of the world around us. 
all right? It is in this thing called the ego that we name all the things in our environment, that we see how our environment works, that we interact with others. It's the logical part of your brain that hopefully is turned on most of the time. Now, the super ego, all right, is sort of the overarching part of the brain. This is where we have our morality. This is where we have right and wrong. Um, this is where all the things that are taught us by our society and our parents and our teachers. Um, this is where we keep all of that stuff. So the super ego is the one constantly trying to keep the id in line. All right. The id always seeks pleasure and always avoids pain. And the super ego then has to be the part of your brain that thinks, well, that would be pleasurable, but it's not appropriate. All right, and this little quote here. Uh, the super ego aims for perfection. It compromises that organized part of the personality structure, mainly but not entirely unconscious. That includes the individual's ego ideals, spiritual goals, and psychic agency. Your conscience. All right, so your super ego is a part of your brain that has all the rules up there and then is trying to... Um, through your ego, through the rational part of your brain, keep your id basically under control. Now, uh, a few other things here. Um, a Freudian slip, all right? We see this in, in jokes a lot. Um, but basically, a Freudian slip is when you say one thing, but you mean another. All right, and we can do this in a silly way um, by saying, you know, what if you mixed up, uh, you were in a nervous situation and you mixed up the word best and breast. Oh, um, or sometimes the, the point of Freudian analysis and psychoanalysis, right, is that the therapist, you lay down on a couch and you just talk about whatever is in your mind. And in this stream of consciousness, occasionally there are clues, right, um, that will sort of tell the therapist, you know, what your mind is kind of really thinking about, all right? Um, and a lot of times, if you maybe mix up uh, your wife's name with your mother's, ooh, or, um, you know, just, just different words, all right? The point is that as we're speaking and we're thinking, we're constantly using the ego part of our brain, the logical part of our brain. But those other parts, the id and the superego, are constantly trying to influence what happens in the ego, and sometimes they mess up. And sometimes our slip-ups can tell us a lot about perhaps our current situations, connections to past trauma, or, you know, what we're really thinking about. Are we really thinking about sex all the time? Like most of the time we are. Um, so, just to wrap up here, all right? So the conscious mind, okay, is the rational, logical part of your brain. All right, it's a problem-solving part of your brain. It's part of your brain where you have good emotions, empathy, love, some anger, you know, things don't go right. But it's the part of your brain that you're using, I hope you're using, um, every day. It retrieves memory, all right, it's great. But the unconscious mind, all right, is a reservoir of all of our feelings and experiences. A lot of what we do, again, is taking painful events or trauma and pushing them from the conscious mind into the unconscious mind. Okay, and the unconscious mind influences our behavior and our experiences in ways that we don't always understand, all right? Through our dreams, through certain kinds of feelings, things like deja vu. So the balance for a healthy mind, all right, is always in between. Now, we can get to our unconscious mind, all right, through a study of our dreams, through the study of our thoughts, through psychoanalysis. And what Freud is telling us is that if we do not do that, all right, the traumas that we have pushed down into our unconscious mind will force their way into our conscious thought processes and not always in ways that we understand at all. 
So again, there are lots of interesting psychology classes and philosophy classes here at UNM. And if you found any of this particularly interesting, I would, again, really push you to pursue it further with people who know it uh, better than me. But Freud, in our story, is one of these thinkers, right? Like Marx, like Nietzsche, okay? Who is trying to pick apart the way that we as human beings work, all right? And to set up a set of logical laws to understand how the human brain works. All right, good luck.